heard this custom-designed digital overdrive pedal called the Tiki Drive, running a real-time custom overdrive algorithm on an STM32 H7 microcontroller. In this video, I'll show you how to create your own digital symmetrical soft clipping overdrive algorithm by modeling an analog circuit and also what we need to pay attention to, for example, anti-aliasing filters, equalization, and so on. We'll implement the algorithm in C on an SCM32 microcontroller, then do some real-time tests on the hardware with oscilloscopes, function generators, and of course, the electric guitar. A huge thank you to Altium for sponsoring this video. I use Altium Designer to design the hardware, the PCB for this Tiki Drive pedal, and the one we'll be using in this video. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below, or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab, and you can get yourself an Altium Designer free trial and 25% off your first license purchase, so you can check out all the cool new Altium 365 features. We won't be going much into the hardware design in this video, but if you're interested in general mixed signal hardware design, looking at DSP systems for audio processing, make sure to check out video number 78 on my channel, which guides you through exactly that. A huge thank you also to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. I had these Tiki Drive PCBs manufactured and assembled by PCBWay in China, and they did a great job. I'll leave a link to them in the description below as well, and I'd highly suggest checking out their services. Typically, when we talk about overdrive and distortion, we're talking about the electric guitar, maybe your bass guitar, and so on. Occasionally, they will be used as effects, maybe on vocals or drums and so on, but it's predominant to shape the audio sound. If you're a guitar player, you'll be familiar with the various overdrive pedals that do this for you, mostly analog, there are some digital variants. But of course, overdrives also exist in amplifiers, where we might have a clean channel, which is not distorted, and then also an overdrive channel, which adds in digital harmonics, does some tone shaping, and we get a classic overdriven sound. The question is, how can we reproduce maybe an amps distortion or an overdrive pedal distortion in software digitally? How can we model what's happening in these analog circuits and do all this processing in discrete time on a DSP? Before we get to that, we need to see what analog overdrive even does to the signal and how it's created in the analog domain using discrete circuitry. Overdrive essentially is clipping. It's applying a non-linearity to a signal waveform. This produces additional harmonics in the signal, and in combination with some filtering will give you an overdriven and distorted sound that you can change depending on your requirements. This non-linearity and adding harmonics is typically achieved via clipping, so effectively cutting off parts of the waveform or transforming them non-linearly. There are many types of clipping methods used in overdrive and distortion effects, and as we saw, these are mainly in guitar pedals and amplifiers. For example, soft clipping, hard clipping, we can use valves or tubes, and we could also use maybe diodes or other semiconductors, such as FETs and so on, to achieve clipping, and we'll see how we do that in just a second. Here's a very famous overdrive pedal for guitar. It's the Ibanez Tube Screamer with a very, very simple schematic. In essence, if we look at other overdrive pedals or the schematics for distortions, they are all rather similar. They will consist in some sort of input buffer, which is effectively provides a high impedance to your instrument. We feed this into a gain in the clipping stage. We do some filtering to shape the tone, maybe some equalization, low and high pass filters, and then the output buffer, maybe a volume control as well. What we're interested in this video is this clipping stage right in the center. We have a non-inverting amplifier, which provides some amplification, but we also have these back-to-back -back diodes. And this is where this soft clipping in this case happens. We'll see how this works in just a second. But this is what we're interested in and in seeing how we can model this effect. In essence, what we saw were these back-to-back -back diodes, and this will lead in this op-amp feedback path to what's known as symmetrical soft clipping. We're discussing this because later on we want to implement this overdrive and distortion, this clipping algorithm, as a discrete time digital system. So we have to make a model of this non-linearity. In essence, we can think of a very simplified model of having an input voltage, a series resistor, these back-to-back -back diodes to some sort of bias voltage or ground, and we take the output at these diodes. Now, if we imagine applying a signal to V in and we increase the amplitude of that signal, what happens at V out? Let's just look at a static characteristic. As we start ramping up the input voltage from zero volts very slowly and seeing what happens to the output voltage, we'll see that we'll actually get the graph on the right hand side, which plots the input voltage on the X axis and the output voltage on the Y axis. For the most part, above the forward voltage of the diode in either direction, remember these are symmetrical, so this works for both positive and negative voltages, we simply get the output voltage is pretty much the input voltage. Of course, this depends on loading and so on, but we're thinking of idealities here. 
So we get this linear domain where these diodes are effectively invisible in the circuit. They're both reverse biased. But as we approach essentially the forward voltage or the knee of one of these diodes, depending on what voltage polarity we have, we start getting these nonlinear effects, as you can see at the top right and the bottom left of this graph. And this is the knee of these diodes. Once the voltage is greater than or equal to the forward voltage in either direction of one of these diodes, we get what's known as hard clipping. The output voltage is simply the forward voltage of one of these diodes. The voltage is clamped, so to speak. And depending on what we set the bias voltage at of these diodes, of course, that point can shift. But this is what leads to the symmetrical soft clipping static characteristic. It's due to the effect of these diodes that they are either invisible, we start to see the knee, and then they start to be fully on, fully forward biased. And this is how we get the symmetrical soft clipping characteristic. Mathematically, we can approach this as a piecewise function. We have this linear domain in the center, then we have this knee, and then we simply have our hard clipping where our output is one regardless of the input above a certain threshold. I've taken this from the book Digital Audio Effects by Udo Zelzer, and this is this piecewise function. This has been used in many different algorithms. We can, of course, play around with the values, but this exact function will map to this graph on the right-hand side. So between zero and a third of our input voltage, we get two times the output voltage, so we do have some gain if we want. We'd, of course, put an amplifier beforehand. The knee is described by this quadratic function between a third and two-third input voltage, and the hard clipping is simply a saturation to one for an input voltage of two-thirds to one. Of course, we can scale this for different input voltages, different levels. We can feed in larger signals to reach clipping early and so on. But this is the basis of our overdrive algorithm. As we said, we can, of course, pre-amplify the signal before we go into this clipping section. And this is what we saw this tube screamer does, where we amplify with a non-inverting amplifier. And this means we reach saturation earlier. I've plotted this here, so for example, for different input levels, if we have 1 volt input, 2 volts input, 10 volts, and 20 volts, we can see our 1 volt signal gives us a normal curve. But as we increase the gain going in, or the amplification going into this diode soft clipping circuit, we can see we get this very, very hard saturation or clipping, for example, these curves in the center, where we only have this very, very narrow linear range, and then we immediately go into hard clipping. What we can then also do, instead of just feeding in constant voltages, on the right-hand side we can feed in sine waves. For example, these are 50 hertz sine waves, the frequency doesn't really matter for now, of varying amplitudes. So we have 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.75. For a 0 0.1 amplitude sine wave, we effectively just get a doubling of the signal due to the two times factor. But this is still in the linear domain, we get no overdrive, no clipping. However, as we increase the amplitude of our input sine wave, for example, of the waves right at the top where have gains of 0 0.5, 0 0.75, we can see this characteristic clipping chopping off these nonlinearities in the output waveform. And this is what will lead to an overdriven sound. But as we'll see later, we still actually have to do some more processing to make it sound somewhat nice. What we also need to look at is not just the time domain behavior, but what, for example, the frequency response, the FFTs of these signals are. Because there are some problems involved with this, especially with a discrete time digital model where we have a fixed bandwidth due to the Nyquist limit. If we look at symmetrical soft clipping in the frequency domain, we can see the frequency content, because of the nonlinearity, depends on the input amplitude. If we're in the linear range, we take the FFT, if we're in this soft clipping range, when we have this quadratic soft clipping, we need to take an FFT, and the hard clipping, we also need to take an FFT. So on the right-hand side, I've done a simple FFT in MATLAB for various input amplitudes, ranging from 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, to an amplitude of 1. For example, this blue trace right at the bottom, this is still in the linear domain, we simply have the fundamental, this was at 50 hertz, and we don't have any other frequency content. However, as we get into this quadratic or soft clipping domain, we see additional harmonics appear in the signal, as we are approaching a square wave at the output, we'll add in predominantly the third and fifth harmonic. Now, as we approach the square wave, as we hard clip, as we can see on the left-hand side of the static characteristic, we are approaching a square wave, for example, for a sine wave input, we'll get many, many, many more harmonics. And as you can see, this extends to the Nyquist range. And as we'll see, there's a problem with this. The problem is that we're in the discrete time digital domain. Effectively, if we were in the analog domain, we would have infinite harmonics stretching up to infinity with, of course, decaying amplitude. At low input amplitudes, of course, we're okay. The static nonlinearity behaves linearly. It just doubles the amplitude, assuming we don't reach any sort of saturation. 
at medium, let's call them input amplitudes, we have a static nonlinearity that squares the signal. Squaring the signal actually expands the bandwidth of the signal. For example, we can think of our signal composed of many different sine and cosine waves, as Fourier showed us. And if we square one of these sine waves of a given frequency, we'll actually see this doubles the maximum frequency in the signal. And we can see that by trigonometric identities. For example, doing a quick Google search for trig identities, we can see that if we square a sine wave of a particular frequency, we actually get, for example, a phase shifted sine wave of the output, so a cosine of double that frequency. And this is where it starts to become problematic. Already this squaring expands the bandwidth of the signal by double. Even more so when we get to high, let's call them input amplitudes, the static nonlinearity effectively hard clips the signal. So any signal above two thirds gets immediately mapped to one of the output amplitude. So effectively, this is a square wave once we reach those kind of amplitudes. Effectively, we have harmonics up to infinity, so to speak. The takeaway is that clipping increases the bandwidth of the original signal significantly. However, as we'll be in the digital domain, we have a Nyquist limit, which is half our sampling frequency. So because of this increased bandwidth, we have nowhere to put this increased bandwidth due to the Nyquist limit, very simply speaking. So this frequency content generated actually will fold back into the Nyquist domain. So between zero and half the sampling frequency. And this is what we know as aliasing. And this is then called aliasing distortion. Aliasing distortion doesn't sound very nice. This is the distortion we don't want. What we want is our overdrive and clipping distortion, not aliasing distortion. How do we get around that? Quite simply, we have to use an anti-aliasing filter. The anti-aliasing filter you might have heard of, for example, in graphics, in audio before you maybe reach an ADC and so on. It's effectively there to reduce the bandwidth of the original audio signal so we prevent or minimize the aliasing distortion or aliasing in general. This is effectively a low pass filter. After filtering, so once we limit the bandwidth of original signal to some sensible amount, and we'll see what that is later, the signal then can be passed to the static nonlinearity. It's important that the anti-aliasing filter is before our clipping section because the clipping section again will expand the bandwidth. Once we've limited the bandwidth with the anti-aliasing filter, passed it through the static nonlinearity, the maximum frequency content at the output of the static nonlinearity will then be limited due to the filter. However, we have to say that we can never quite eliminate aliasing distortion, but we can suppress it considerably. Two questions, how do we choose the filter type? You could get away with maybe using an IIR if you can accept quite a level of aliasing, but I typically would go with an FIR filter. An FIR filter has typically a better frequency domain performance compared to an IIR, but of course it's computationally more expensive, especially if we have a lot of filter taps or long filter. The cutoff frequency, remember we have a quadratic nonlinearity. This doubles the signal bandwidth. So if we have an original Nyquist limit of the sampling frequency over two, fs over two, we multiply that to fs. So effectively our cutoff should be at or before half the Nyquist limit, so fs over four. The problem is we also have hard clipping at some points where we effectively have maybe even a higher bandwidth. But a good starting point I would suggest is to set your anti-aliasing filter cutoff frequency at about half the Nyquist limit. So that's fs over four. Let's see how to generate one of these filters. I won't be going into detail on FIR filters and how to implement them. I do have a whole video discussing this and showing you how to do this in software on an embedded system. Please check out video number 17 on my channel. To design the filter, we need to find the coefficients. Now there's many tools to do this, paid and free. A really cool tool I like is a, is a web-based one called T-Filter and I'll leave a link to this in the description below. Assuming we have a sampling frequency of 48 kilohertz, which is very typical for audio, what we want is to have our cutoff frequency at a quarter of that. So half of that is the Nyquist, which would be 24 kilohertz, and half of that again is 12 kilohertz. So what we want to do is change our sampling frequency to 48 kilohertz. Then we have a pass band and a stop band, and of course we can add more pass bands and more stop bands, but we'll keep it simple for now. Our stop band should be from 12 kilohertz, all the way to the Nyquist limit, so 24 kilohertz. And our pass band should be, let's say, zero hertz, so all the way from DC to below the cutoff frequency. Remember, we have this transition band from the start of the cutoff frequency to the stop band. So let's say we put that at maybe 10 kilohertz. Now, with all these default options in place, if I just click Design Filter, we get this kind of filter. We can see the taps at the bottom, so the number of coefficients, and we can see the coefficients on the right-hand side. Now, this filter is okay but we can see we have quite a lot of ripple in the passband and our stop band attenuation is only minus 40 dB. If we want better performance with FIR filters, that is better frequency domain performance, better separation, less ripple, we will have to sacrifice computation because the filter will be longer, there will be more taps. For example, if I change the maximum allowed ripple in the passband to just one dB instead of five, 
clicking design filter, we can see the actual number of taps has increased to 39. If we want, for example, better stop band attenuation, so going down to minus 60 dB, clicking design filter, we increase the number of taps again. So we have a 53 tap filter. But something like this is completely fine for a processor such as an SM32 F4, H7 and so on. It'll be quite easy to handle this. And this might be a good anti-aliasing filter. At 12 kilohertz, we have minus 60 dB of attenuation and the pass band we have fairly flat. It might, of course, depending on how much aliasing distortion you can sacrifice, you can have, it might be good to decrease the pass band, especially for guitar or instruments, we might not need 10 kilohertz of pass band. So we could maybe shift the pass band, make it narrower, so we have a stop band already at 10 kilohertz. So this is something you can play around with. This will have some influence on the sound, but this is something you should do before the static nonlinearity. And we'll see how to implement this in software later on, of course. We're almost ready to go over to our software environment where we can implement this on an embedded system, our STM32 microcontroller, and see how this then sounds at the end. What you'll see with digital overdrives and distortion is that there's quite a lot of room for creativity, adding in different blocks, playing around with parameters and so on. I'm just showing you one of the simplest structures to go to a fairly decent sounding overdrive. There are some blocks we have to keep fixed. For example, we'll have to have some sort of non-linearity. Now this could be soft clipping, this could be hard clipping. You could have some sort of model, maybe via lookup table. So there is some freedom in there. And we of course need an anti-aliasing filter, unless you like the sound of aliasing distortion, which might be a thing as well, of course. In the case I'll show you in this video, I have a static non-linearity and I can control the gain that goes into this. So I can increase the amount of distortion simply by amplifying the signal before it goes and passes through the static non-linearity. Before that, I have an anti-aliasing filter designed using the tool we just saw. This is an FIR type low pass filter with a cutoff frequency of a quarter of the sampling frequency. Then of course you can add in some variable blocks. So this could be maybe some equalizers. You might want to add in some other effects as well. This could be before, this could be after, and so on. What I would typically suggest as a very simple structure is to have before the static nonlinearity, including the anti-aliasing filter, is to have some sort of equalizer. And typically you might want to remove some of the low end, so that means placing in a high pass filter, because this can be muddied when you get to the clipping section and might not sound that great. So typically I will place a high pass filter before all of this and at the end, after I've distorted the signal, we will have quite a lot of high frequency content in there still. So that's why at the end I like to place a low pass filter, so to smooth out those high frequency harmonics. Both of those we could, for example, control. We could control the cutoff frequency of the high pass filter and control the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter at the end. We'll do all of the computations on a sample by sample basis. I won't be going into much detail in this video on the overall project setup, how to set up all the I squared S streams, how to do double buffering and so on. I do have a video on this, which goes into great detail on how to achieve this on an STM32 platform, which can of course be applied to other systems. But this is video number 55 on my channel and I'll leave a link to this in the description below. I also have a video on IRR filters, meaning we won't be discussing this too much in this video, and this is video number 32 to see how you can implement IRR filters to create, for example, audio equalizers and so on. I also have various other videos on digital audio processing talking about filters, how to implement EQs and so on, so please check that out. For example, video number 46, video number 89 and so on will tell you exactly what you need to know to implement your own audio equalizers, which we'll be needing in this overdrive. The hardware we'll be running this on, as we saw near the start of the video, is this custom-made DSP board. It features a fairly beefy STM32H7 microcontroller. There's a separate board which connects via FFC connector, which has some potentiometers, switches, and so on. We have a mono input and mono output, some basic audio circuitry in the bottom here, which feeds into this 24-bit codec, and we read in the data and push out the data via an I2S stream and DMA. The foot switches and other connectors aren't mounted here, but we can enable the effect via a foot switch, enable maybe a secondary effect via foot switch, there are various LEDs and so on. But effectively, all the processing is happening on this STM32H7 microcontroller, which we'll be programming with our overdrive effect, and we have our analog front ends and the codec right here. The potentiometers on the other boards, as we'll see in the live demos, we can then use to adjust, for example, filter cutoffs, the amount of distortion, and so on. The actual overdrive algorithm I've kept very, very simple. I've just put this in a .h and a .c file. Let's go through the .h file first. I have an array which contains the taps or the coefficients of the FIR filter, and I used the online tool we saw earlier to design this. The basic specs are that it's the cutoff frequency is the sampling frequency over four. We have very little pass band ripple, about 60 dB of attenuation in the stop band. Then I have a struct which contains all of my overdrive parameters, such as the gain, we have an input low pass filter, 
which is the FIR filter, our anti-aliasing filter, we have an input high pass filter and an output low pass filter. We have various functions, for example, to initialize the overdrive, to set, for example, the sampling frequencies, base cutoff frequencies, and so on. We can adjust the high pass filter on the fly using this function. We can adjust the low pass filter on the fly using this function. And for the high pass filter and low pass filter, I've used IRR filters because they are so easily adjustable on the fly. We can recalculate the coefficients in real time. Then we have our main update function, which takes the input and produces the overdriven output. In the .c file here we have the coefficients taken from the design tool. We have our initialization function where we null all of the filters. We have the set high pass filter cutoff function which just computes the coefficients on the fly to set the high pass filter cutoff frequency. Same for the low pass filter. The high pass filter then of course our main update function. Keep in mind this is a tiny bit rushed. Please refer to the other videos on FIR and IRR filters and this will explain everything more in depth. The actual update or overdrive function itself is fairly simple. We take in our input sample and produce an output sample. In this particular overdrive, and again, you can mix and match, you can move things around within reason. Of course, the anti-aliasing filter needs to come before the static nonlinearity. This is what I do right at the beginning. I do my FIR low pass anti-aliasing filter, and please refer to the FIR video to see how this is actually implemented in a step-by-step -step fashion. After the anti-aliasing filter, I pass it through a variable first order IR high pass filter. And this is to remove some of the low frequency components, and I've commented here, as these will sound muddy when they are distorted. So I'll take out some of the low frequency content first, using this very simple first order IR high pass filter. I'm using IRR because this is variable on the fly. I can adjust the cutoff frequency, for example, using one of the potentiometers. And this, of course, might depend on the user's taste, what they like to hear. After these two filters, I then finally get to the overdrive section, which is my clipping section. First thing I do is apply some gain, so some amplification to the signal which comes out of the anti-aliasing and out of the first order IRR high pass filter. This is to maybe increase the amount of overdrive or decrease it, again depending on the user's taste. Then I do this whole clipping section here. This clipping section is simply based on the function we saw earlier, this piecewise function at the bottom. So we have the linear part, we have a quadratic part, and then we have the hard clipping part with these certain thresholds. Of course, you could use different clipping functions, hard clipping, maybe different models and so on. And this is where I would place this. So after the anti-aliasing filter. After this, I feed it through a variable, for example, second order IRR low pass filter. Second order was just to have something different. Of course, you, you could use a first order, but that might have a worse attenuation performance, a worse slope in the transition band and so on. So that's why I went with a second order low pass filter because I can have more parameters to play with, but this is mainly to remove some additional high frequency components after the clipping stage. Again, please refer to the IRR video to see how you can calculate these coefficients and how you can then compute the output. Finally then, I just make sure to clamp the output between minus one and one. The signal from the codec is also converted to a signal between minus one and one, and this defines the maximum input and output scales for the system. Then I simply return the overdriven output, so to speak. Again, please see the I2S double buffering video to check out how this project is actually set up in detail. I'll just briefly run you through main.c. I include my overdrive. I have various parameters that I can adjust on the fly with my potentiometers, and this is sampled via separate ADC. I have a main callback function, which processes the current audio buffer. So we loop through the audio buffer, we apply the processing and pop that out via DMA to the DAC in the codec. I have mapped my control settings, these potentiometers using the ADC, so I can set the gain, I can set the high pass filter, the output volume, and the low pass filter. There's not too much to this once you have the main code set up, and again, please refer to the previous video link in the description. Now let's test this out using oscilloscope and function generator, and then we'll plug in the guitar later on. Here we have the Tiki drive now hooked up. I've connected a serial wire debug connector via this Tag Connect probe. I have these input and output jacks. These are actually clipped to probes of an oscilloscope and function generator. And this goes into my analog discovery probe by Digilent so we can monitor the input and output waveforms and we have one channel of the wave gen connected to generate arbitrary waveforms. And this is our basic test setup. On the Tiki drive itself, we can then enable and disable the effect with this foot switch and we can play around with the gain, volume, low and high pass filters with these potentiometers. So now let's give this a go. The first thing I'd like to show you is just the clipping section without any other filtering and without the anti-aliasing filter to show you what happens with this aliasing distortion. So all I've done is I've commented out some things and I've just simply fed in 
to the clipping section the input raw without any filtering multiplied by some gain so by some sort of constant and i simply return the clipped output no filtering as we saw with the test setup, I've connected my function generator to the input. I'm monitoring the input and the output. So my waveform software, my PC-based control software for the oscilloscope, I have a wave generator. I have a one kilohertz sine wave set up with an amplitude of one volt. I can start running this and then go to the scope where I have both channels. So the input is yellow, the output is blue, and I also have an FFT at the bottom. So if I click on run, if we zoom in, we can see the input wave is our pretty clean sine wave at one kilohertz, and the output is this rather distorted square wave. So we have basically maximum distortion. This is hard clipping, and this won't actually sound very nice. What we're interested in is the actual FFT. So if I scale this, so I get a better FFT resolution, the input is our yellow trace, where we just simply have the fundamental, and this is at one kilohertz, and the output is the blue. So let me just get rid of the yellow trace, and let's look at the blue output. You can see all of these other harmonics, intermediate frequencies and so on, also below the fundamental. So we have these harmonics below. This is all aliasing distortion. We have some distortion, of course, due to the clipping itself, but a lot of this are these aliasing artifacts, which also fold back below the fundamental. And this really won't sound very nice. And this is something you want to avoid. Remember this image and we'll compare this to when we add in the anti-aliasing filter. All right, now we have the full overdrive algorithm loaded onto the Tiki Drive pedal. On the bottom right of the screen, you'll see I have the pedal set up as we just saw with the usual test setup. I have the waveform software open. Currently, I just have the wave gen in place at a one kilohertz sine wave and an amplitude of 500 millivolts. The Tiki Drive is off, so we have true bypass. The input signal is the output signal. I've set up both channels here on oscilloscope and also the FFT below. So if we turn the Tiki Drive on now. We can really see with these default settings, whatever they're at, we're getting significant distortion and overdrive already. The yellow curve is the input signal and the blue curve is the output signal. We have some phase shift due to the various filters, input output delays and so on. But the blue curve has the fundamental frequency but is closer to a square wave due to our clipping algorithm. So I can, of course, increase, decrease the volume as well. So that's our main volume control. But then we can also decrease and increase the distortion. So if I decrease the distortion, we'll see we'll get closer to the sine wave because we aren't in that clipping range of our clipping algorithm. So we simply just get a linear gain. We can also see that on the bottom on the FFT. On the FFT, we have a slightly lower amplitude. So I'll try and match the amplitudes with the volume control a near match with the volumes. And we can see the FFTs are the same. We don't get any clipping behavior, no harmonics and so on. The more I increase the overdrive distortion, we can see these harmonics start to appear in the FFT. If I increase that more and more, you can see all of these harmonics starting to appear. So we have our fundamental as usual, which is at one kilohertz, but then we have a third harmonic, which is at three kilohertz, fifth harmonic, five, seven, harmonic at seven kilohertz, and so on. So all of these odd harmonics start creeping in the more I increase the distortion. So with pretty much maximum distortion here, we have this decaying FFT plot fundamental with all these odd harmonics and as we would have expected. What I can now do, of course, is also play with the high and low pass filters. So my high pass filter, this is now set at maximum. So I have maximum pass through of my high frequency harmonics. But as I reduce the cutoff frequency, you'll see less of the high harmonics will pass through. We can see this in the time domain as we're smoothing out this square wave. You can see the edges are considerably less square, more towards a sine wave. And also in the FFT plot below, we can see the harmonics are attenuated. And remember, this is after the clipping stage. So I decrease the cutoff frequency and you can see my harmonics are subdued as well. So we can see that in the time and the frequency domain. Mm -hmm. 
you very much for watching this video. I hope it was interesting and useful and you can try and develop your own digital overdrive algorithms in software. You can see it's fairly straightforward. There are a few things you have to pay attention to, but that's about it. If you like the video, please leave a like, a comment if you have any questions, and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with any future videos. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.